Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Friday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Condon and Dennis Dick. On our radar today, we'll recap the action from yesterday in the pot stocks and beyond and meet. we we'll talk about the uh, bloodbath in this IPO market. Not a good day for Peloton and Endeavor canceled theirs outright. We've got uh, a chip wreck. Thank you very much, Micron. Delta Airlines making a big investment and some ratings on uh, on their radar as well. So we got a lot to get to. Our guest today, Phil Davis, the founder of Phil's Stock World. He would join us at 8.35. And then after Phil, I think we'll end the week with a nice little trivia segment. So, Joel, what's going on here in the overnight trading markets? Uh, we have a nice range, uh, nearly a 22-point range overnight. We went down to 7150 Buy the dippers came in, took us up to 29.93. We're still holding in that area. Yesterday's high is the focus, 29.95. That's Thursday's blowback high. That's a big level. And then coming back on the downside, let's see what happens at the close of 80.50. Crude in the red by 50 cents at 55.91, filling the gap from the uh, Aramco uh, delay or bombing, whatever you want to call it. Gold in the red by $14 at $1501.20. Silver in the red by 33.7 cents at $1757 and a half. Bitcoin, that's down $155, clinging to the $8,000 level. Uh, before we bring in, we'll bring in Triple D here in one second, but I just want to give a shout out, a happy birthday uh, to my longtime good friend, DP Steve, Donald Paul Steve, even though my dad said never trust people with three first names. Uh, he's been my swimming buddy since I've been uh, five years old. He is 56 today. Uh, DP, happy birthday. And uh, you want a good story about DP, a real quick one? Let's do okay. it. Okay. So, he, you know, like we are five, six, seven years old. You know, we used to hang out and do sleepovers each other's house and, you know, just, you know, raise hell. Well, remember when you used to be able to um, – like order pizzas over the phone and then get them delivered at other people's house. Did you ever do no, that? No, you maybe order prank uh, pizzas to people's houses. Yeah. You were like that? Yes. You're a bad kid, man. It's hilarious. because It's amazing you your your daughters are so such good girls considering how bad their father was. It's a terrible thing to do. No, it's not. It's hilarious because you could like, you could do it and then you could look out the window and then you could see the pizza truck you know, or the, the delivery guy go up to the house and then you're a bad kid. <laughs> hey, Joel, uh, you, you know, what you would like if you go on YouTube, there's a, a, a famous uh, a prank call that I heard a long time ago where they uh, called a pizza place, placed an order and said, hold on one second. My my sister wants to order as well. Called another pizza place, connected the two of them and then had them order to each other. That's a really good oh, video. You were a bad kid too, Spencer. Do we did stuff me. like this too. It's these ideas. I, no, that wasn't me. That was wasn't I the me. only good kid? <laughs> that wasn't me. I was just saying it's on YouTube. Well, if you also you naughty kids. You also used to be able to like order beds for people, you know, at one eight hundred numbers, but you know. Holy! Yeah. Stop giving I bad these bad ideas out there. You know what? You need, <laughs> you need to have little Spencer come over and. Spencer that that all went away with caller ID. You know that exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So caller ID, all the prank phone calls, it was over for that. So, Dennis, you don't have the heating pad on now. No, I just took my heating pad off. The shoulder is hurting, though. It was a rough night. I was trying to sleep. I'm trying to get comfortable. And I don't know the shoulder. It's really uh, an issue here. But I'm going to the chiropractor again today. Hopefully, we can work it out. But, yeah, my clicking arm is not as good as it once was. Isn't there a song by Toby Keith? I'm not as good as I once was or something. Oh. You know that? You're the country fan. You should know that song. I don't know that. I'm not I, I, as good as I once was, but I was good once as I ever was. Yeah, see, I know country. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's my story this morning. I'm not as good as I once was, at least from uh, my clicking hand perspective. So we limit our clicks right now. Only clicks ne on necessariness. No no high frequency clicking here. Did just, just for an update, DP said that uh, he texted me. He said, I put him up to it. 
the the PT. Ah. Great thing. Oh, he's listening. Yeah. <laughs> DP, you're bad too. Bad boys. Okay, let's move on from the prank phone calls and the sore shoulders, and let's talk the sore market, at least in the chip sector, because we've got a chip wreck on our hands. Although off the lows, Micron and my long-term portfolio not helping my long-term portfolio today. No, uh, not at all. Uh, Spencer has it in his short term. I, I, no, just I told you not to do it. I don't actually have it. Just for context, we're oh, having a, we're, we're having a uh, paper trading contest on the news desk. Well, throughout Benzinga. Oh, really. and you have this as a paper so, trade. And have it in paper. So it you know what though, if you're really paper trading in a contest, it's always best to put high the highest risk stuff in. Exactly. And I, because exactly. I, 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 I can remember this from school. And they would do these, you know, contests or whatever. Or you'd enter them, you know, and it, it'd be like, yeah. and people would put like a diversified portfolio. You never win like that. No, you want to win. Mean, your risk is zero. You're risking zero in a, in a paper port, like, in a, you know, on a contest. So why not put the maximum risk? So I would put all penny stocks, all the highest flying stuff that I possibly well, could. Well, here so you got Micron into an earnings report. It's a good call if you're in a contest um that's you know you have no downside okay so i'll tell you what i shorted nike and went along micron so i'll tell you what i'm going to do next time and you can do the opposite how about okay. that all right micron uh not looking good this morning q4 just dps 56 cents beat uh the 48 cent estimate the sales were also good 4.87 billion versus 4.56 billion but the uh the q1 guidance was actually okay it was in line the sales guidance was was also in line so it actually wasn't a bad report from the headline point of view um there were other things from the conference call. They talked about Huawei, of course. Yeah. Um, but regardless, stock got hit. It sh it actually bounced briefly. And then the fade trade is just continues to be on. We're going to talk about that with the pot stocks in a little bit here. But this fade trade continues to work, at least on, especially on earnings, too. We've seen so many moves that get faded. Initially, it sold off a bit, and then it rallied. And I think we got up almost to 50 bucks. Actually, I think we got over $50 looking 50, at that 50, chart 50, 50. just briefly. And then they pulled the rug out from under it, and this thing fell five points from that point in time. So it got ugly there. Uh, I didn't really I, – I had a, a one after-hours trade, I think, and it just uh, a little down and dirty in it where I was trying to do a scalp. But um, I'm still holding in the long-term portfolio, though, the retirement account. Uh, the reason – I was just looking at it, and I'm like, Spencer, they really got to blow things away here. I mean, this stock has had a major rally since January. So I was just thinking – they really need to blow it away. And it sounds like it was a decent report. Uh, snuck over 50. Pre-market low, 44.78. Let's see what you have on the dailies here. Uh, that fills. Do you have a little gap in there? Yeah, that fills a little gap that you had in September. But it's one of those 15-minute charts where there's a sneaky little buyer in there, right? You made the pre-market low. Someone felt they missed the low. And they're just nudging it higher. Now, I'm not, it's not bolting up and going anywhere, uh, but just kind of looks like if you do back and fill towards that area, you may find some buyers. Just a, you know, a little bit of a rounding bottom here in the 15 minute chart. If you want to gap fill from yesterday, and I'll give you some good resistance going forward here. Uh, wow, you're not going to see 48 for a while. If and when this ever gets back up to 48. Uh, you did have uh, three lows right in that area. So if it goes into rally mode, you're trying to pick a bottom here, gets near 48. I identify that as resistance. So all the chips are down with this. Um, you can just go uh, anywhere you want to go, really, in the chip sector. SMH overall will show you the story. And it was down a buck last night. Video getting hit. It's down too. They're off the lows because Micron's off the lows. So a lot of these other chips come off the lows. LRCX is down six still. So it's getting hit. Applied materials, which I do have a day trade on. Uh, it's down two and a half percent here. I just thought it got overdone last night. So I was trying to uh, play from the long side a little bit. Um, you can even go AMD, Intel, both trading down as well. So it's an ugly day for the chips. And then, you know, you can continue to go. I mean, there's you know, a couple dozen of these things. So anything to do with chips today, if you're a chip stock, you're probably in the red. Uh, NVDA, I'm just looking. It has a really, really hard support level. We're still ways away from it. But if this gets anywhere near 171, 171 and a half, I see four consecutive lows right in that area. Yesterday's low considerably higher. Look at that. We're even holding yesterday's low here in uh, NVIDIA. So uh, it's that, off the after hours lows. NVIDIA, yeah. how low did we get last night, Joel? Did you notice the after hours chart? In what stock? NVIDIA. I think we were down four bucks at one time in NVIDIA. Um, so, so it's come off the lows. 
Let's see here. Where did it close? I feel like we were in the 173 handle. 177.34. Um, let me see here. I don't. Let's see if I got to change my. You know, my 24-hour chart is not showing that, Dennis. Uh, so so when you, I'm just making. Oh, it up after. Then. Oh, I see it. I after see hours. It. Yep. Yep. I see what you're talking about here. Uh, 174.34. Okay, so not quite to the 173 handle. So we're a buck off the lows here in NVIDIA. We're off the lows in most of the chip stocks, including Micron itself. Remember, if you're trading a chip today, it's going to be Micron as your leader. Micron starts to catch a bid. The rest of the chips will follow suit. And always remember, your leader is going to be down usually more than any other stock in the sector, usually twice as much. So keep that in mind when you're trading the chip stocks here today. Lots of other news. We want to move away from the chip stocks. Um, we've got a well. Uh, we've got Delta buying a big stake in LTM. What was the stake, Spencer? It's a twenty percent stake for one point nine billion dollars through a public tender offer at sixteen dollars per share. Wow. So LTM having a big lift on this. Obviously, trades as an ADR over here, but big time volume even this morning for this ADR, which probably normally doesn't get that much volume over here. Lifted on this, no pun intended, up 37% here in the pre-market. I don't think Delta's doing much. Delta's slightly in the red here. Um, it's a smaller deal for them. Uh, also could impact American Airlines to a certain extent. American Airlines is trading in the red here, AAL. But LTM is your beneficiary of this investment, and it's up significantly. One of its biggest moves ever. Did you say $16? That's not a takeover, yeah. though, Joe. No, 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 just no. they bought a stake. They bought it at 16? No, no, no. And that's that's how they're buying it. Right. So it, it's a public tender offer of $16 a share. That's how they're making this investment. It's an investment. They're not acquiring the company. No, I know. Well, why are they why do they just go out in the open market? Am I missing something here? I don't know. So these companies no. do it how they want to do it. Remember that um Ben, I know you're not gonna remember this. Did it it was Amgen and somebody? They did a deal where like they like Bought the right, like some, re it was like 150 points away or something. Um, a biotech company, Amgen. All right, I know so, Amgen. Uh, yeah. I don't I, know who I, they were buying. I, them. I remember Microsoft buying LinkedIn for serious premium. Yeah, no, no, no. This was a, this is a while ago. I can't I'm, remember. Amgen's done a few acquisitions over their years. So, I mean, a lot of these bigger uh, biotech companies, that's how they grow, right? They buy the smaller companies up, they're buying growth. So um, okay. don't, don't I'll try and think of it later on the show. Yeah. Okay. So moving away from that for a second, let's go back over. Let's just recap a little bit of yesterday's action because uh, we had the fade trade button pushed. And I think we were right here, Joel, beyond meat. When we were talking about was 163, it did give a lot of it back. It's lifting here a little bit this morning. Some commentary from some analysts piping in on this. Obviously, it's going to matter how this, you know, how this burger tastes. <laughs> That's why we joke we may be going to go and do a taste test. I did not do one yesterday. I'm still cooped up with the shoulder injury, but I intend to taste the Beyond Meat Burger. But quick technicals on BYND, and then I want to go to the pot stocks. Yeah, let's just uh, look at yesterday's range as our guide in the issue. Uh, it sold off hard off the open. And let's say you even didn't mess with it in the pre-market trading and you waited for the regular session. 160.51 open, 160.60 hot. So if you shorted that opening print, you only took like, not, you probably didn't even get a chance to cart it up and it was in your favor. Went all the way down to 148.50, rebound to close at 54.34. I'm just going to keep an eye. Those are my parameters, especially that closing yeah. price. That's I'll really keep a close eye on that one today. Uh, little get got a gap to fill down to 143, but I think it's going to be tough sledding on both sides. One, because shorts are jammed, right? That was totally out of the blue, and you know they had the tender offer at what 150 once or the secondary. 160. 160. That turned out like, hey, I'm getting my money. That number back. came into play. Yeah. 160. 50, the high. It opened right at the high, too. No heat. If you decide just to short it right at the open, you basically took no heat, and the stock came straight in seven, eight bucks. Now, I actually tried to find a locate on Beyond Meat, and I could not find Good. it again. I so I wanted to play this from the short side. I even talked about it on the show. I couldn't get a locate. So that's right. Um, it's a tough locate still on the street. That's what keeps this price inflated, in my opinion, is that it still is a tough locate. And the shirts that have it are paying for it, too. Um, so a little bit of a squeeze yesterday. Those are great parameters that Joel just gave you. If, for whatever reason, it can start to crawl its way up and start to take out that high, then it gets interesting. But I tend to think it's going to gravitate down towards those lows over the next day or two and eventually take it out. 
So I even I, I'm I'm still on the bearish side on BYND. Do you want to hear what the analysts had to say? Uh, a couple yeah. analysts. Yeah, uh, sure. Stevens came out. Uh, doesn't see uh, a a rollout in the U.S. Uh, for the beef alternative uh, as being likely in the near term for supply chain reasons. He said, uh, we view an alternative chicken product in the U.S. as a more likely nationwide launch in 2020 or 2021 in conjunction with its, meaning McDonald's, exclusive poultry provider, Tyson Foods. So they see a chicken product more likely in, in the U.S., an alternative chicken product. Jeffries, on the other hand, talking about Beyond Meat, said a broader rollout of the PLT, that's what this is called, in the U.S., could conceivably add 40% to the firm's full-year 20 sales estimate. I mean, it's going to depend on this, and they're that's right. A big number. I mean, it, it is going to depend on this. Even if it's you know 40% increase, the valuation is still insane even at that. But let's say, hypothetically, that this goes very well, this test in southwestern Ontario, which I am skeptical of. Let's say you know it does go well. That would bode very well. I mean, if they said, you know, yeah, we're going to roll this out and you'd probably see another 20% pop in this, depending on where that is. But we're not going to know that for a while either. I mean, it's not like they're just going to be like, okay, we've tested this for two days and now we're going to, you know, now we're going to run with it. I mean, that's why, you know, a lot of tests would probably do with the taste. Go do some surveys, maybe outside McDonald's in a week and a half and say, we tried the new $6.50 burger, um, the Beyond Meat Burger, and how is it? If everybody says, no, I didn't like it, then you kind of, you know, could get a feel that maybe they're not going to roll this out. But it all matters on how this tastes. It's a lot riding on it. I, so I think we know, we know what we have to do. We got to taste know, it. More than that, we have to be the ones to support this thing. We have to go over there to Windsor and buy as many of these as we can. That's what we have to do and show that people <laughs> want it. And then maybe that'll make a difference. I don't know. We, we, had, a good huh. debate. we had a good <laughs> debate in the office yesterday about it, but... I mean, I think that the, just the macro thing. Joel, you okay? So, yeah, 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 excuse me here. I, I think there is a move towards, you know, healthier diets and vegan diets. But is it healthy? I don't know about, I don't know about the Beyond Burger. It, it's but, not supposed to be healthy. That's not the point. Is it supposed to save the animals? It's, supposed to, it's better for the environment. It's better. I don't care about the environment. I but care that's about what people, health. but that's why people. Well, people eat, do. Oh, that's why they go <laughs> there vegan. is a lot of people that care. My wife cares about the environment. They don't She's... go vegan to be healthy. They go vegan. It's like, vegan is like any diet. You can be healthy or, or unhealthy, right? You go vegan because it's better for the environment. That's why people do it. And you and listen to the Beyond Meat CEO, you know, in interviews that that's that's the play. It, it's an environmental play. That's what it is. And that's maybe why it stays up, because the environmental play is important here. I mean, and we are coming to political season, too, and there's going to be a lot of uh, candidates here talking about the environment. I mean, this is very important going forward. And right. I saw water levels like I talked about on the Great Lakes. I don't know if it's environmental or not, but the water is up four feet uh, in the last. And you talked about, too, even on Lake Michigan. They're all connected. It's amazing how high the water level is right now. I don't know if that's environmental related or not, but if it is, that's kind of scary. But going back though, so they're not like healthy by default, right? They're high in sodium and, and I don't know what the, what the calorie count is there, but don't assume they're healthy because they, they, they might not be right. They're they're not automatically healthier. So I should stay with my quarter pounder with cheese. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So that, Let's go back. Let's move away from Beyond Meat. Let's talk the pot stocks. This was great news for the pot sector. That news, like we suspected might happen, immediately faded. All of those stocks, many of them closing in the red on this great news. So a lot of pot stocks in the pre-market, if you weren't watching yesterday, were up 4 to 5% on what was the, the vote out of the House, the passing of the some? safe, The Safe Banking Act. The Safe Banking Act. So this was good for the pot stocks, and this was supposed to propel them higher. It did propel them higher 4 or 5% for the pre-market in about the first minute of trading. And then the profit takers came in, and not only that, the people who are underwater came in, and they sold these things. And we actually saw MJ, the ETF, close in the red. Most of the other ones closed in the red. You can look at CGC. You can look at Kronos. You can look at ACB. You can look at Afria. Some of them slightly held on. But ugly day for them, considering that this was supposed to be news that was supposed to push them, and it did not. 
And that just keeps telling it this sector is broken. We've been bearish this sector for a long time on the show now, at least I have. And I continue to remain in the bear camp. We got an analyst, I think, jumping on board here this morning with my opinion, because canopy growth is getting downgraded here today, trading down 2%. It looks like it may challenge the low of the move. Who's downgrading CGC? I I didn't see that one, actually. I'll go find it. I saw it go by my tape. So you can look. It's probably in the pro there. It just happened just before the show started. So that's why I didn't see it because I was too busy doing this. CGC downgraded at Bank of America. Cuts on lack of industry growth. Hey, they must listen to pre-market prep because that's what we've been talking about there. Downgraded downgraded to neutral, but they're keeping... Oh, the Canadian price target 35. So you got to do the funky Canadian math. So 1.3. So I guess it's in the ballpark. Symbols weed, if you're listening from Canada, obviously W-E-E-D. It's a great ticker symbol. Not a great stock, unfortunately, at least not lately. All right. What are, your st- what are your thoughts on this pot sector? I mean, it's over with. I, mean, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and okay, let's say these things do turn around. And I was just thinking about this yesterday, like with Roku and some of these stocks. I mean, how much, how much stock are they going to have to chew through to get back to you know, the levels that they were at. So many people are, are stuck. I mean, they just don't go back up. I mean, like you knew you really explained it well yesterday when the stock is at new all time highs, there's no pain out there and there's yeah. no momentum buyers taking it up. But when you come off something like that, I mean, how many people were rewarded, rewarded, rewarded buying the dip and Roku and these stocks and, you know, and selling it out, flipping it out, trading. I mean, it becomes, you know, a, behavioral you know, pattern and it works yeah. but now it doesn't so it's just tough i like i said just technically speaking a lot of stock to chew through that if these stocks are to recover and you know if they start showing some earnings and some growth and uh you know i guess it's not we don't have full u.s approval yet right mm-hmm. now a lot of different factors into it maybe we'll we'll dig up alan next week and see what he has to say let's jump back into uh well there's not a lot of earnings here there's actually none this morning at all we did get veil if you want to talk mtn which is a good symbol as well they are trading up they were trading up last night on the report they are trading up here this morning as well they sped up at 235 let's do mtn and then we'll go to the ratings yeah great symbol uh q4 eps they, they lost two dollars 22 cents per share but they were supposed to lose two dollars and 53 cents so that's a beat sales 243 versus 240 uh, million dollars so they beat on the sales number as well full year net uh 20 net income coming in at a range of 293 to 353 million dollars and they offer they also file to uh, uh do a stock offering to fund in acquisition so yeah lots going on there anyways it was trading up on this last night trade up to 239 yeah, um, i got it over 240 yeah, so it's a 240. I mean, I keep that as my number. There's lots yeah. of highs above 240 there. So I don't know if this is going to be an earnings report that's going to propel it through that or not. Resistance is resistance until it's broken, and it looked like it was holding last night. Uh, there's a major resistance. I'll just give the zone because I see 246, like eight highs between 240 and 243. So I like to split those numbers, 241. And I just, it's gotten up there several times since mid August. It just never held up. So I use that as a resistance area uh, for MTN. Let's go to the ratings parade. There's quite a few, um, some interesting ones. Um, where, where do you want to start there, Spencer? Real quick, Lori Jones is yeah, new in the YouTube ahead. chat. And uh, she has a good question, Dennis. And I know you have your own formula. Is there a site for determining how influential a particular analyst is for upgrades and downgrades? There is one that comes to mind. Uh, tipranks. tipranks. It's not perfect, but it's it's probably the best alternative, the best one that I've seen. So that's a good site. Yeah, it's not perfect. Tipranks.com. They do they do uh, rate analysts uh, by their, their their success rate essentially. Yeah. Um, Use that as a guide, right? It's not going to be like it's not like what Tip Rank says is necessarily. It's not like their way is reality, but it is a good, a, a great place to start, uh, and it, it gives you uh, some some history of the analyst and, and what they've covered and their and how they've uh, upgraded or downgraded stock, you know, over the past couple of years. Definitely a great place to start. TipRanks.com. That's a great site just to come and look, um, you know, at what's happened lately and maybe, you know, for the earning ratings for the day. I mean, Benzinga Pro is always your best source. We try to get them as fast as we possibly can. And I love the way the pro outlines it because it shows you a lot of information about where they're coming from, where right. the PT is going, 
and pro, you know he pro, can look back pro in the past of where they've been. Right, pro is probably the best to look at the history of of, of a particular stock in uh, as far as ratings go, or a particular analyst. Yeah. But tip, tip ranks is better to look at. Well, to essentially grade them, right? To offer a grade, right? It's out of five stars. Offer a five, uh, you know, a, a grade based on five stars of of the analyst calls, essentially, and then say a ranking of where they are compared to their peers. So that's what Tip Ranks does. I don't know too many other sites that do that. Could you uh, do you got your pro up there? Could you just yes, real, I, real quick? Could you just because I tell you the way I like to use the pro, um, go to analyst ratings in uh, U.S. Steel. All right, one. You like to see how many have a sell, how many like you well, can look at look at, the, look at the pricing action okay. there, the downgrades in X. Look at all these down yeah, two out. This is going yeah. a while back. But look at that. You had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven downgrades, eight this out is all nine. What's seven. happened lately? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> look at that. Underperform uh, was the one for quite a Swiss, but JP Morgan came out. They went from overweight to neutral. They lowered it. They lowered the price target, and on that day, holy macro, it kissed the low of the move. It missed it by a penny. 10.16 was the low of the move. 10.17 was the low, and it got a nice bounce off that. So um, I know the way Lori was talking about it, you're kind of looking at it as, you know, how good are they and going with the momentum of the analyst. But I also like to look at it as, like, you know, a potential fading tool. And it's just like, you know, all yeah, the- is everybody downgrade this down? There's nobody left to do it. And we, we saw, you know, AT&T get five upgrades in a row. Remember that one time? And that was the top. And yeah. that was a few years ago because AT&T started going back up here now. But, I mean, you got six downgrades basically in a row on that U.S. deal. And you know what? Stock is not really going down on it anymore. So, you know, there's a tradable bottom here in U.S. deal. Um, I don't like buying dogs and they're hard to go up. But I'll tell you, that 10-16 10 17 you gotta tell me you can't tell me these levels don't work sometimes that kiss within a at one penny away from the low of the move on september 23rd and it held so now you got technicians that are saying there's a potential double bottom here so that's where it sets up actually nicer from the long side so if you're along this you have a tradable bottom let's say you can pick it up around 11 bucks you give yourself a buck takes out 10 and you're gonna say okay well it didn't work and i'm out so you're risking 10 percent I always like two to one, so I'd probably want to make 20% on that if I had that on for a swing trade. Now, I tell you, it's been a very difficult environment to try to call bottoms and stocks, so we're not saying that is going to happen, but there's a potential that there is a double bottom in place here on U.S. Steel, which makes me nervous to be short. All right, Dennis, I know I'm just going to comment on this stock because I know you don't like to talk about it. Um, Rite Aid, we're being asked that uh, in the YouTube chat. It had a what a candle yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, what was what that? Heck? I don't know. What was that about? I don't know. When was it? It ran from eight bucks to like nine ninety right on the opening print. Like in the, in the opening, it was some crazy moves on the open yesterday. Some crazy ones. I got caught on the wrong side of Newcore. You see that? Holy cow! Um, anyways, um, I got caught on the wrong side of that. It went ex-dividend. I should know. You know, my own strategy is supposed to be short them on the ex-dividend date at least trying to get short them. But anyways, I had a dividend capture strategy on. I couldn't get out. And obviously other dividend capture players didn't get out either. And it just tanked. So that one did not work out. But you saw some wicked little moves on the open yesterday. One-sided moves. That right aid was a wicked candle there too. Always interesting when they saw out right below a big whole psychological number like $10. Uh, you did a dividend capture. You captured a loss. I did capture. I captured the dividend. I got the dividend, but I got more of a loss than I got got for the dividend. So uh, dividend I, capture has not been working well this quarter. Um, you know, I know these things. I do the, all these strategies. I employ, you know, probably a couple dozen different types of strategies. And I can tell you the fade trade has been working on these earnings. What I can tell you is the dividend capture strategy this quarter has not been working that well. Could you spend a lot that? of stock? So dividend capture is just basically buying the stock day before it goes ex dividend, hold it overnight and try to get out the next day. With, um, you know, if you're capturing a 50 cent dividend, you try to get out the next day with like only a 40 cent loss and you make 10 cents. You know, these are scalping strategies done by professionals. Obviously, if you're retail, you got to consider tax implications and other stuff. I don't have to consider any of that because 100 percent of everything that I make is taxed. So I can do these things and not have to worry about the different tax implications of, oh, there's dividends and they're taxed differently than capital gains. I mean, it's all 100 percent tax for me as a prop traders so i don't have to worry about any of that so i can employ a lot of different types of strategies but that's what dividend capture is is basically just buying the stock ahead of the ex-dividend date and then selling it the next day um and that's why a lot of times these stocks run up 
ahead of the ex-dividend date and the week after just because you've got those mechanics taking place of dividend capture traders. Uh, real quick, too, before we go on to the next thing, uh, Mr. Perez wants us to check out Natty Gas. And I'm looking at the futures here. And it had a super run. I, I don't like this because there's so many digits here. But let's see. We went from 206 to what? Uh, but, um, let's call it 280. So figure that. Let's figure a 17, uh, 70 point move, 35 cents and six, 241. Two, it has to hold in right here. Figure your own 50% retracement. But boy, oh boy, if this is a real rally here that it had in August and September, it's going to find some support here, right at 240, 241, hanging in there right now. But uh, just it going seems like it never rallies, though. Like, remember that time, you know, where, where was it, like seven, eight years ago, and Natty Gas went from like three bucks to like 14 or something crazy? And uh, then we just come back, and we're always like two or three bucks on Natty Gas. Are we not, when the hell are we not two or three bucks on natural gas? Uh, what, years. Yeah. I feel like we've been at two, three bucks for years. Yeah, we had a pop in 18. We did get a little, a little fade. We got up near five, but then it faded hard, came down and made a new all time low. Uh, you had that pop in 08, 09. I don't know what that was all about. It went from 16. That was the big one. Yeah, 16 to 22. And then I don't know. I guess people are just, you talk about a trend. That was a four year trend from 08 to 12. And then you got a little reprieve. I don't know, just a horrible look at chart. If you have some good scalping techniques here or something for it, but uh, not a pretty looking chart. I, I don't trade natural gas futures. I do trade the UNG every once in a while. And obviously the UNG has contango issues there, which tends to underperform natural gas itself. But I trade some of the natural gas stocks. I'll trade on any given day, but um, it's been a tough investment to look and get and, and looking long-term and, and gas and oil for that matter as well. All right, well, let's go back to the ratings. Let's do one or two more uh, before we grab Phil Davis. And I want to talk yeah. about that match Phil's group. world. I, I want to do match group here. We haven't discussed this one in a couple of days or since this news broke a, co a couple of days ago. But they did uh, receive notice of an FTC investigation regarding fake ads. And the analysts, wow. have, the analysts have come out and defended it. So JP, this is on Wednesday. JP Morgan defended it Wednesday. Bank America defended it yesterday. Said any dip is a buying opportunity this morning. Uh, it's Evercore upgrading it to outperform. So the There's are so many issues here, though. Like, think about, you know, you've got an investigation. you got Facebook going to take them head on for competition. you got a nosebleed valuation on this thing when they, there's stocks that haven't, you know, been, you know, they haven't been in favor of the nosebleed valuation stocks for the last month. So now you get a rally, a significant rally. You get a lot of two days ago losses back. I think you get anywhere near 80. You got all kinds of sellers. I know we're not close there because we're 7420 here in the pre market, but what's your upside here? Maybe four bucks, maybe, you know, if it, if the if the market turns, but your downside's way more significant. I think it sets up better as a short. Uh, Dash, you made a good call on this uh, when you were on the show. Uh, I think it was Monday because I know you. I made a bad call two years ago because I was bearish at a 50. <laughs> All right, well, so maybe I, I've stayed bearish. So if you stay bearish long enough, you eventually make a good call, I guess. <laughs> I've got this one wrong. So take an, all, anything that I'm saying with a grain of salt because I thought Facebook was going to you know, t attack it a lot sooner than they did. Uh, boom, boom. I mean, you mentioned that 78 and a half area, 78, 78 and a half. Yeah. That was an area of a bunch of lows. And then it came back up into that area. Hmm. It's up. It's up 291. I mean, you're going to get a little. Here's the key for this today. 74.54. Uh, that was your high, your two-day high. Let's see what it does there. If it holds 70, gets above that area, holds that area, then you're open. You got some room to run to 79.05. I think you'll find some sellers along the way. Uh, but it's really important to see what it does with that big, ugly bar uh, from, uh, from Tuesday. All right, I want to bring on uh, today's guest, Phil Davis. He is the founder of Phil Stock World. Phil, good morning. Yes, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Doing well. How about yourself? Oh, fine. Just getting ready for our weekend here. So, Phil, uh, when I saw you last, it was in oh, January in January at our cannabis conference in Miami, and you were telling me how you were looking at the space. Uh what is your reaction to yesterday, uh, the Safe Banking Act? Obviously a great a great uh, thing, 
for the industry. We talked about it on the show. The stock's faded off that. Uh, give us your high-level take here on cannabis right now. Um, well, don't forget that the stocks, when you say the stocks, like the MJETF or whatever, right? They're basically trading Canadian cannabis stock. So the reaction you saw yesterday was more of a reaction to, oh, shit, now we have this gigantic competitor. The United States is going to start coming online and seriously competing with Canada, and it's going to flood supply. They're going to have access to banking. They'll be able to ramp up their production, so on and so forth. So the when when you guys talk about, and, and not just you, I hear it all over the press, frankly, everybody's talking about, oh, no, the marijuana industry didn't react well to that, blah, blah, blah. That's because the, the most of the companies that are affected by this in the United States are not public. So you're not seeing what's going on in the industry. I, I own a couple of uh, cannabis companies at this point. We have a, a hedge fund that that, um, that has these things. And um, it's fantastic. You could not have a better outcome for us, but that's because we're going to kick Canada's ass. You right. know, we have giant growers in California that are bigger than the biggest guys in California, in uh, Canada. And those companies are in big trouble. They've got nowhere to sell to. The market they planned on selling to and that they, they are, you know, all their uh, business plans long range were looking to sell in the American market. The American market's got plenty of pot for itself. Right. So, so it's not, it's not great for the public companies, but the private companies are where the real money is, is what you're saying. Well, American private companies, because in America now, what you have now is you now have banking where we can bank. We can now, we don't have to carry our money in, in knapsacks anymore, which is very nice because. Let me tell you, the logistics of dealing with money was one of our biggest problems in our California operation, because it's just insane how much cash you have to move around in, under the current laws. What about the valuations on some of these? Get money in cash, it's just a, a incredibly annoying. So what about the valuations on some of these pot stocks? So because they are still trading with those big uh, valuations, a lot of them when you look at them from an you know an earn, obvious an earnings perspective, because a lot of them don't. Yeah, make I, money. Would, I wouldn't touch them, frankly. Yeah, um, there the is competition one, uh, in in Florida. I live in Florida, so I know these people. True Leaf. Um, I forget the symbol. Maybe you guys have it, but they're running at a pretty nice valuation. Actually, that's one we are interested in as far as the stock goes. It, this is it's OTC. I think it's TCNNF OTC. Yeah, they're not a small company. They're doing really well. They're growing nicely. Um, they, 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 they only, and, and, and all the money you see in that thing, when you look at their numbers, it's only the medical side. They only do medical marijuana in Florida right now, you know, they're, but, but they've got, um, uh, distributorships, probably about 40 of them all over the state. They're moving into other states. They've got a, a nice product. They've got a, more importantly, though, they have a, an actual system that runs like an actual business. And, um, and they got knocked down with the rest of the pot stocks, but uh, but very unfairly, I think. So I think long term, that's a great American company you can invest in. So what it comes down to for you for the sector is is you're eyeing American companies, and really you're more bullish right now in the private sector than the public public market. I'm way more bullish on the private sector. In fact, we're just we you know we we have a, a cannabis fund, and we are. Um, actively in several states now the big advantage you have when you're a small private company is because the the states can't even trade with each other right now so every state is is its own little microcosm and i can invest in a company and i can invest in chicago and have one of 20 licenses in chicago i know i've got a certain share of the market so i can run my numbers with, with pretty good confidence uh, i don't even have to worry about people from other states coming in and selling their product and I, I know my i know my only competitors are the people who have licenses in the city of Chicago, um, and 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 you know, and, and you can see from what the cities are doing, they, they don't want to have too many uh, cannabis shops, so they're going to be very very stingy with the licenses for the foreseeable future. Uh, growing, we stay away from. We like we like manufacturing and distributing. You know, growing is uh, it's a crop; it's not that hard to grow. So we're not very keen on the growing side of the business, but we love the manufacturing side. We love the distributing side. We're on the line with Phil Davis. He's the founder of Phil's Stock World. Joins the show uh, every few months to give us uh, his input on the markets. Phil, you always uh, you always cook up some good option strategies for us, and uh, long term too, because we talk about short term and long term trading. And uh, 
I can remember, I, I think you were on the Silver Wheaton train. I think uh, that was a while ago. That was kick-ass. Yep, yep. <laughs> in, fact, that, in fact, that was so long ago that you were saying Silver Wheaton. They're now called Wheaton Precious Metals for the last uh, almost two years. <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, I know so you, you look at that two-year chart, that was, key. that was actually two years ago. That was our trade of the year, so, uh, Silver Wheaton. So what's the trade of the year going to be in 2020? Ah, uh, that, that's not decided yet. We decided on Thanksgiving what the trade of the year is going to be for the next year. This year it's IBM, and that's going through to 20. All of our trade of the year is a two year trade. So going to 2021, uh, we loved IBM, but that's back from November when they were closer to 100. So now they're about 140. So unfortunately, it's a, a little late to jump in on that one. All right. What, um, about, the, what about the metals markets? I'm sorry? The, I mean, what about the metals now? They've had a nice move to the upside. I like, I like gold right now, the actual metal gold. Um, I like ABX also. Bar I mean, the Barry Gold changed their name too. It's always so confusing. So Barry Gold is now G-O-L-D. And um, I like them if they went down. I haven't seen them in chart lately, but if they dipped, I like them. We actually, we cashed out, by the way. We were in cash. We cashed out all our portfolios. And uh, except for my hedge fund, which has a lot of like, you know, hedges. <laughs> but, but as far as uh, the member portfolios and Phil Stockworld and stuff, we cashed everything out. See, um, now I can see the chart. AB, uh, Barrett Gold is too high for me to like it right now. Uh, but, but gold itself is touching the $1,500 line. So if you play the futures, those are the uh, wide key futures. They're just testing $1,500 right now. And I love it for a bounce off that line. And gold is, um, gold pays pretty well. I mean, it's a, it's a, I forget the number. I think it's uh, $320 per, um, per dollar move in gold for the contracts. And what about this? Uh, what about a $10 the, move at least and pick up 3,000 bucks. What about uh, this IPO market? Uh, you've been getting down and dirty at that at all. Boy, some stocks have uh, not performed very well. Have, uh, there any IPOs that you've been looking at, or you just need more data, more information? On these we, we're, you know, we're value investors. You know, we talk about options, but we're value investors who use options for hedging and leverage. But we don't, you know, we don't buy IPOs. It's very rarely an IPO where you say that's a good price. Peloton, we're actually looking at if it comes down below like, uh, I'm going to say 20, but somewhere around 20, I'd be kind of interested in Peloton as a long term play. Uh, only if they pick up options that we want to see options that we can play to, to, to edge that bet. But the long term strategy of Peloton is actually kind of attractive because they've only got uh, half a million members right now. Um, using their stuff and they could easily get a penetration up to about 5 million people overall as they expand across the country and also of course other countries so um, you know I think they'll hit their numbers they'll be able to justify what's currently uh, an 8 billion dollar valuation but I would rather buy them at closer, closer to 6 billion because that way I know within three years we can hit our numbers. Phil as a value investor what was your reaction to earlier this month when we saw that two, three week uh, reversal essentially of growth got punished and value got rewarded. Um, I couldn't be happier. I mean, I hope that's, in fact, that's what led to us cashing out our portfolio is there's a drastic reversal into all the value stocks we've been pumping money into uh, for the whole summer, basically. Like every time they went lower, we put more money in and more money in and more money in because it was just so stupid. And we were waiting for a flight to value, and we got it. And once we got it, we, our portfolios went up so much, we said, screw it, let's just lock this in and get it out. So you used it as a selling opportunity. That's, that, that, yeah. that's what I wanted. But, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled because, again, as a value investor, you want to see value. I don't want to see all the money in the market going into uh, Chipotle at, at $850, which is completely insane. I mean, it's, it's a, the valuation of those guys um, – as a fast food restaurant, at uh, they got to be fifty, probably more than fifty times earnings. Um, that makes no sense, you know. And you see money chasing into these things. By the way, oh, if you want a good short, um, you guys were talking about chips earlier. There's like a chip uh, apocalypse right now, uh, especially for uh, NAN chips and DRAM chips. The uh, prices have gone to hell. Um, that's something we were discussing yesterday in my chat room. Um, uh, Texas Instrument. Still very, very high in the channel, 
They don't actually have a lot of name in DRAM, but the whole sector is getting a bite. And Texas Instrument got a real pass last quarter because they missed by, they were 9% below last year in revenues, yet nobody punished them for it. You know, because, because it was compared to the rest of the sector, it wasn't that bad because the whole sector has been selling off. Uh, but it, but this earnings coming up, we think they're going to come down. In fact, we just took a short position on Texas Instrument uh, using the 130 line as a cutoff. So that's where we're at now. We're looking for Texas Instrument to go below 130, not drastically, 125 or whatever. But what we did is we took the 140, 125 bear put spread for January, and we actually sold the 130 calls. And uh, I think I forgot the numbers, but it worked out really cheap. It was like net $500 on a $7,500 spread. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's net $2,500 on a $7,500 spread. So you can, you can make 200% of your investment if Texas Instrument has, has a bad earnings. Wow, that's a good call. I like that one. Stock up, uh, showing some strength. You have it out there near all-time high. Uh, what about crude oil here? We did finally fill that gap here down to buck thirty-five. I get uh, what I'm seeing here. I can't verify this. Oil drops after Iran's president said U.S. offered to remove old sanctions in exchange for talks. I have no validity. I can't say whether that's true or not. But <laughs> make your head oil here. Where are you stepping in to buy oil here? We headed back to the lower forty-dollar handle. There's a fundamental bearish premise on oil because there just is simply a glut of oil all around the world. Um, every time someone buys an electric car, every time somebody buys a car that gets 30 or 40 miles a gallon, they are having or less than having their consumption from the previous car they own. You know, unless, unless somebody happened to own a 30 mile a gallon car before, but there aren't too many people like that. Most people are getting better and better mileage cars every time they buy a new car. That's grinding efficiency higher, which is why Trump's trying to stop it. Uh, he's trying to do a video for his oil buddies. Um, but it's grinding efficiency higher. It's lowering our consumption of oil. Companies are lowering their consumption of oil using various techniques. Solar's taking other energy forms off the market. So down the road, and especially because other countries, we, we, know, we don't care about climate change, but the rest of the world does. And those countries are very incentivized to make, make it go lower and lower and to uh, reduce their climate emissions. So again, oil is on the way out as a fuel source. And over the next 20 years, it probably will be a very, you know, it'll trickle down to very low usage. But that means, and if you say, oh, that's 20 years. Yeah, but every year it's 5% less. You know, when you start grinding away and knocking out your oil consumption, you're basically knocking about 5% a year down off the consumption levels. <clears throat> it's probably going like 2.5% right now and it'll accelerate over time. I won't go to zero, of course, but there'll always be chemical uses and such for it. But, 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 you know, there'll be way, way too much oil by then. And that's why it's, the Saudis are so desperate to IPO Aramco, because Aramco, there's a, there's a thing called, have you guys talked about stranded oil? You no. know what that is? No. Stranded oil means the value of Saudi Aramco, and the value of Exxon, for that matter, is based on the fact that they've got these reserves of oil. And, so, and, and so Saudi Aramco has $5 trillion worth of oil in the ground, right? But now, it's only the value to the company if it's going to be extracted. But you can only extract that over about a 50-year period. The amount of oil those guys have is going to last about 50 years. So it's worth $5 trillion if you pull it out over 50 years. But what happens if in 20 years or 30 years, you just stop needing it. Then the oil is stranded. Then you have a stranded asset. So now you're cutting what their value of their reserves are, which is a part of the value of the company, by uh, 40%, 50%, depends on how you look at it. Uh, also, then there's a the cost to extracting and so on and so forth. So it's a net cost. It's like it's like gold companies. It's, it's not about how much gold's in the ground. It's about how much money they make pulling it out of the ground. Right. right. So oil companies are the same. So the reason the Saudis are so desperate to get a Ramco IPO right now is because, first of all, oil is going to trend down. There's nothing they can do about it. I mean, the, these OPEC guys have 2 million barrels of oil offline, and they just had a whole big refinery taken out for a week or two, and it still didn't help. There's still a huge flood of oil. We still had a build this week of oil in the U.S., um, in, in fact, if the U.S. wasn't exporting, do you know the U.S. exports 3 million barrels of petroleum product every day? 
Yeah, we are big time in that. Yes. Yeah. So that's 21 million barrels a week of of not U.S. demand. So when you look at the numbers of U.S. demand numbers, they're completely um, what's the word? Uh, they're they're mis whatever. I can't think of the name of the word. Anyway, so they're they're distorted. That's their right. <laughs> they're completely distorted by the fact that we send. 15% of the oil that we get out of the country as refined products. That's not U.S. demand. But they think that they act like the U.S. consumers have a steady demand that's slightly growing. That's not the case at all. The reality is U.S. demand by the consumers in the U.S. is down roughly 12%, while our exports are now 15% of our total oil consumption. All right. Phil Davis is the founder of Phil Stock World. Phil, thanks for the time and have a great uh, rest of your week and great weekend. Thanks, guys. Good talking to you. All right. Uh, 8.50 here, uh, guys. And I want to end the week with a little segment we started doing of late. Hot potato, hot potato. Hot potato, hot potato. Hot potato, hot potato. Potato, 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 potato. All right. So I came up with some questions. All right. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Me so, versus Joel? You versus yeah. Joel. I'll beat okay. Joel. So the theme of today's uh, trivia... Minimize your chats, Dennis. <laughs> the, theme, the theme is New Jersey. But the majority of the, <laughs> the, majority <laughs> of the questions are business or market related. What oh, exit? Oh, man. What, what exit? This could be exit. tough, actually. What exit? Okay. So I came up with a, a few questions last night. I've never, uh, ever been to New Jersey, so I could be okay, in trouble okay. here. Okay. We're, we're going to start. Don't worry. I said the majority are business or market related. Not all, but most. I'm scared. So, so, so here we go. Here we go. Um, and, I, and I must ask, please, please answer in the form of a question. Okay. Oh, what is <laughs> It's like Jeopardy. Fun? Yes, like Jeopardy. Okay. okay. I, I want to start with Dennis here. We'll start easy. I, I, right. I think this is easy, but maybe not. <laughs> oh, great. Dennis, the board game Monopoly is based on what New Jersey city? Uh, I had I, I thought he might have pro- trouble with this. What New Jersey city? I wasn't sure if you I don't even know if I know any New Jersey cities. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. I, I, I wasn't sure. No, I'm in okay. trouble. I'm going to go zero, I think, on this whole <laughs> Joel, team. Joel, do you, do you I want, don't know anything about New Jersey. Joel, you want to steal this one? You don't know it either? I, I'm. Oh what my. is it? Atlantic City? Yes. Yes. Okay. Joel. Oh, that All was, right. Oh, I should have known that Okay. One. Atlantic City. Okay. So, here, yeah, I'm keeping track here. Joel, uh, he's going to win. Joel, I don't think I'm going to get any. No, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, Dennis. I guarantee you will get some. Joel. Okay. Joel, this one is Shit. This one is sports. Uh, and then, and then there are more market questions. I want the sports one. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry. ask him what the hockey team is. No, I, I know Joel knows this. Uh, Joel, the first intercollegiate college football game was played in New Brunswick, New Jersey, in 1869 between which two schools? <sighs> Rutgers. Oh, these are hard. What, what is? What is? What is Rutgers? Or who is? Yeah. Yes. Great. Great start. Versus Michigan. <laughs> No, no. Rutgers, I, yeah. N- no, no, no. Okay. I'm sorry. I knew uh, it was Rutgers. I'm sorry. You, you, you were, you were half right, <clears> but <throat> it, it, it is Rutgers, Princeton. Was the answer? Rutgers, oh, Princeton. Oh, right there. Same right. proximity. Yes. Okay. Okay, Dennis. Are you ready? Yes. In August 2017, Bill Ackman took an activist stake and sought to gain control of this Roseland, New Jersey-based company. Herbalife. What is what is Herbalife? No, I'm sorry. Dennis, you're oh, not, you're wrong. Oh, I'm he was sorry. short. He was short in the light. I'm sorry. Oh, you're right. Oh, oh my goodness. I'm it was sorry. Icon that had the steak. I've already was, forgotten. It was automatic data processing or ADP. I wouldn't have got that. Okay. I'm sorry, Dennis. I thought you were going to get I just that. automatically thought I, I didn't listen. I just heard Ackman, <laughs> Activist, Herbalife. <laughs> I got to okay. listen better. All right, Joel. This Camden, New Jersey-based consumer staples company has a long-standing marketing campaign featuring NFL players and their moms, including former stars Jerome Bettis, Donovan McNabb, Michael Strahan, and Brian Erlocker. What is this company? Mm, what is Campbell's Soup? Yes, Campbell's Soup is right. Okay. Uh, good, Joel. Good for Joel here. I, I guess I'll give you those. Have I, have I locked them up? Joel, your, your uh, camera's oh, pointing Joel. at your Michigan. I don't oh, need to see your Michigan camera. shirt. All right. All right, all right, Joel Milton. Okay, um, Dennis, the tallest roller coaster in the world is based 
at this Jackson, New Jersey based amusement park. And I'll give you a hint. The company is publicly traded. What is Six Flags? Yes, it is ah, Six Flags. Yeah, Great yeah. job, Dennis. Dennis I'm on the board. Okay. Well, I got one. I didn't get skunked. Okay. Joel, this Summit, New Jersey based company was acquired by Bristol Myers for $50 a share on the second trading day of 2019. Oh, Dennis is going to get this. Um, I know. That's why I asked you. Oh, I should know this. Bristol Myers. Uh, what city was it in? Summit, New Jersey is where the company is based. It was acquired for 50 bucks a share on the second trading day of 2019. Dennis with the steal. Uh, what is... Man. No, it's too long. By the uh, okay. All right. Dennis, Dennis with the steal. And it was $50 a share plus... One share of Bristol Myers, and it was Celgene. What All right. Wow. Oh, you see, you didn't say that plus the share because I knew they did somebody. Fifty dollars cash yeah. plus All right. one share that, of Celgene. That, that wasn't okay. a good Myers. question. If we, okay. I, I trade that herb every day. All right, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis. The two largest holdings in XLV are both headquartered in New Jersey. Who are they? Well, he knows this. I got to think about this. Okay, so XLV. Ooh, there's some big ones in there i'm trying to think what the biggest ones are you know what i think what is johnson and johnson so far so good and what would be a second one like oh what is uh what's the second biggest holding what is unh oh i'm sorry no, no yeah. don't say, can i guess joel can I go, go, joel for the steal Merck. Yes. Yeah. That was Merck. All right. So, so I'll give how big is UNH in there? UNH is big too. You both half credit on that one because you guys. Deemed I got to see how big UNH is because I'm okay. close. It's got to be top five. All right, Joel. Dave Thomas was born in Atlantic City in 1932. 37 years later, he would open the very first location of this. No, local- that's a ridiculous I, question. I, I and UNH that. was third. Oh, okay, okay. Wait, you know I'll... what? Stop. Because Merck has went down lately. It's Oh, no, UNH has went way down lately. So UNH was. It's just because UNH just went down. Oh, my goodness. I would have had that if you asked me that last week. <laughs> okay, I asked you For to... real, UNH just, I... just fell below Merck. I had it. I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Dave Thomas was born in... What in... Is... Wait, wait. I, I didn't finish. Okay. He would, he would open the very first location of this burger-focused... That's a ridiculous food. question. Why? Because everybody knows what's it? What's okay. everybody knows? It's his daughter. Oh, ridiculous! Oh, what's the answer? What is? Where's the beef? Wendy's. Okay, that was ridiculous. I'm getting like throwing these, and you get Wendy's. You better give me New Jersey Devils. Uh, no, okay, all right. <laughs> I, I'm worried about this one. It better be a hockey question in there about the Devils. I, I can make I, 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 I can make one up right now, but it is not, <laughs> not a hockey question. Who are the right. Edmonton Oilers? So. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis. The busiest bridge in the world connects Manhattan and Fort Lee, New Jersey. What is that bridge called? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, Joel for the steal. What is the George Washington Bridge? That is correct. The oh, I should have just guessed the president's name. You should have guessed the president's name. Okay. Joel. This, this one... has got to be over. Well, this is the last oh, one. Questions. Okay, okay. This is the last one. I think I already won. Joel, uh, this fictional city is traditionally depicted in comic books as being in New Jersey. This is an easy one, too. <laughs> no, not for Joel, it's not. Fictional city. You have to know what, who's, what people's interests are. I know Joel wouldn't know this. This fictional city is traditionally depicted in comic books as being in New Jersey. And I didn't know this until I looked it up last night. So maybe, it's maybe I'm wrong. No, I cannot tell you the comic. Um... Is this something from Superman or something? That is wrong. Dennis, for the steal. What is Gotham? That is correct. All right. Oh, I, was close. I said, oh, oh, oh. I, said I won. I think I no, won. No, you didn't win, actually. <laughs> Joel oh. won. How did he win? I had three right. He didn't get and three Joel, right, did Joel he? Got, Joel got four right, actually. Well, Wendy's was, doesn't count because everybody got that one. That was just a joke of a question. I'm sorry. So but that's I'm taking the Wendy's point away and I tied him then. I'm, that's the way it goes. I'm sorry. <laughs> The I'm Gotham. Sorry. I was impressed with my Gotham knowledge. Okay. I, I knew you would know it. That's why I didn't ask you. I asked you. Ah, uh, 
But you, I thought you would get the top two holdings of XLV, but I clearly I would. did really, and and that's I knew UNH was up there. But look at what UNH has done here in the last week and a half; just been killed. So it's probably fallen off. I bet you if we asked a week ago, I bet UNH was the second highest. Oh man, I, I'm, Dennis, so, I'm sorry. I, Dennis, I know these that it. well that I knew. Dennis, was, Dennis, oh. you know, people were doing this for fun, and you're you're like you can make it. You're complaining. Don't complain. I'm, <laughs> so, I'm sorry that the market. Everybody was- wants to win, Joel. I don't right. think I've ever won. Have I ever beaten anyone? We, we did this like uh, twice, though. So I, there's you the- tied with Brent. I'm not very good at this. But maybe what we'll do is maybe we'll try and bring some people from the chat in. Yeah. Maybe, and yeah. Let's get chat two chat, chat contestants right. against each other. Yeah, there is we- a good idea. Next week, we're going to take two people from the chat. Okay. Put them up against each other. <laughs> All right. I well- like that idea. Okay, I'm sorry, Dennis. I, I I really thought that you you had a shot there at the end, but unfortunately, oh, I, got, I just ran out of questions. I needed one more. Not I was going to guess way. who is Taylor Hall. <laughs> Did not go your way today. No uh, Meadowlands guys. Uh, b- before we go, any final thoughts uh, on the market here? Uh, uh final thoughts on the market. Uh. Sell Rosh Hashanah by Yom Kippur. There we uh, go. You know, we, have, we didn't get to the Wells Fargo news. Wells Fargo is trading significantly up. Right. Um, just w- w- who who was right. they getting? Wells DK, Fargo, wasn't it? Yes, Wells Fargo was hired the uh, CEO from uh, Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, Charles Scharf, also Las Vegas Sands, is joining the S and P 500. So you got the WFC trading up significantly. BK is trading down significantly on that news. I'd expect that. Not to hold. I, I think that's a huge gain. Up a buck fifty. I'm a fader of the Wells Fargo. Yeah, you have to be just based on no like position yet, value. but on paper, yeah, I'm fading this. I mean, it's just a big old stock. And if you think of how much it takes to move that stock a buck fifty yeah. in their session, but quite, but the chart looks pretty good. It looks better than some of these other bank stocks. We even talked. Wells Fargo used to be up there in the top ten components, though, but uh, it, it faded. It faded quite a bit. It's been an uh, underperformer in the banking sector for a long time, and now it gets this lift on the new CEO, the Hope Trade here. I think I'm fading. All right, Spencer, tell tell us a little bit about Monday's show here. Monday is going to be. Uh... A weird one. So Joel and I are are both not going to be here on Monday, but it'll be a show with Dennis and the one and only Brent Slava. So that'll that'll be the show on Monday. There is a show. Dennis and Brent uh, will be with you. Joel and I will live from McDonald's eating Beyond Meat <laughs> burgers. Live from McDonald's eating Beyond Meat burgers. Right. Uh, Dennis, uh, Joel <laughs> and I will be back on uh, Tuesday. But it'll be uh, Dennis and Brent in the driver's seat on Monday. If you missed any part of today's show, catch our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, or we watch our show on YouTube. Thanks to our guest, Phil Davis. Thanks to all of you in our chats. Please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes only and not for investing or trading advice. Any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, whatever, email us market at benzinga.com. Everyone have a great weekend. No way Dennis is running the show. We're going to have to bring Chris so, in. I, don't yeah, worry about yeah, it. It's yeah, being taken care Chris of. Chris will be there to run Chris the show in the background. Shoulder and <laughs> his, and yeah. I know. My wife says I have OMS, which is old man syndrome, and I think I do, actually. Right. Andrew's shoulders. Feel better, please. Everyone hey, just a cry, baby. We'll be back with you guys on Go Blue.